26th verse of that chapter. We're going to read through chapter 3, verse 3. John 2, verse 26. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you. You have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, you may have confidence, and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the joy that we have of looking into it and exploring its great riches and treasures. We pray that as we see the glories of Christ and the wonder of his name. We pray that your blessing would be on us. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us in faith, equip us in hope. We pray, Lord, that you would preserve us until uh, that day of glory comes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a powerful thing to have the Spirit of God at work in your heart and in your life, producing a new fruit, a fruit that is not found in the wicked, fruit which is for the glory of God and for the good of God's people. We saw last week that God gives us his Holy Spirit to enable us to strengthen our inner man to overcome the fight against the evils that yet remain within us and in the world around us. The Spirit of God produces one singular but multifaceted fruit, a delicious, wonderful fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth. This is the work of the Spirit of God. It conforms us more and more to the image of Jesus, who himself is the one who is filled with the Spirit, endowed with the Spirit above measure, and displays all of this wonderful fruit in his own person. Today, I want to advance our understanding of our spiritual warfare and look at one of the important motivations for our pursuit after holiness, righteousness, and purity. And that is the idea of our great Christian hope, the blessed hope of the people of God. We have a certain hope that sets us apart from the rest of the world. We have a hope that God himself has given to us to anchor the soul and to uh, keep us looking ahead to that which is yet before us. It is a hope in the sense that it is something that stimulates our faith to trust that the promises of God will be fulfilled. That all that is said about our future, about a day of glory, about new heavens and new earth, will in fact come to pass. And so hope is faith fixed on the future. Hope looks to that distant future and sees it as true and real and rests upon that. We are people of hope. Remember, that's what distinguishes us from the rest of the world. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says of the Gentiles, the nations of the world, that they were without God and without hope. Uh, that's a very significant comment to, to make with regard to folks out in the world today. They do not have hope. Hope to sustain them in this life. 
I wonder if you can think back perhaps to a time when you were, before you had come to faith in Christ, and think about your mindset and how you thought about yourself and your future and how dark and confusing everything looked with regard to the future. The great fear was death and the appearance of death in your mind. And what lied beyond death? Well, there was a sense that there was the judgment of God. And there was a sense of a loss of hope because we are sinners. In Christ, we received a new hope, a living hope. God himself is the God of hope. He's the source of our hope. And so this morning, I want to talk about that hope a little bit and the way that hope has an impact on our lives to enable us to uh, pursue after holiness and righteousness and purity before God. Now, in, in looking at John's writings here, you'll notice that th these writings are infused with the idea of eschatology, or last things, uh, infused with the idea of the future and the dawning of the future that is near at hand. Um, I'm reminded of uh, poetry by Gerald Manley Hopkins, a Victorian poet in England who was a Jesuit by choice. He was raised in the Anglican Church, but he left that to enter into uh, the, the Jesuits, uh, Jesuit society. And he was a, a writer of poetry, but then when he entered into the, the Jesuit community, forsook his poetry for a time, and then later on in his career came back to it, seeing a place for poetry within even a devout life. In any case, one of his more famous poems is called God's Grandeur. Maybe some of you have read that in high school or college. But the opening line is, uh, I think, very, very uh, telling. He says the, that the world is charged with the glory or the grandeur of God. And he, he uses various images to reflect on this grandeur of God which charges all the world. He says it's like shook foil. It shines like shook foil. You take a living foil and you shake it all up and you see the light reflecting off of it. It's as though when you take a look at the world and see all these changes and, and manifestations, there are glimpses, lights of the glory of God reflecting throughout all of this world. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It's shook full of this glory. Now, with regard to Hopkins, I'm not quite sure how he understood that, but within a Christian frame of reference, the world indeed reveals the glory of God in all aspects. And when the Apostle John writes about our Christian life in this world, he cannot help but see everything uh, reflecting the grandeur of God and indeed the coming of that day of glory when we will be transformed and made new, made into the image and glory of Christ our Redeemer. For John, all of life is charged with eschatology, is charged with the sense of the glory of God that's yet to come. And so when he looks at the Christian life and wants to motivate us to purity in our lives, towards righteousness, well, the way he does that is to remind us of the coming of Jesus Christ at the end of history and time. This is the great motivating factor for our Christian life. Christ is coming. I'm reminded of uh, a book that I'm reading by um, Sinclair Ferguson in which he writes about how th there was this controversy in Scotland uh, many years ago now, in which there seemed to be a confusion within the Scottish church and within Scottish preaching, such that there was a focus on what Ferguson calls the benefits of Christ, but not seeing them in their union with Christ himself. And so often we get preoccupied with the benefits that we have in Christ. We talk about justification and the definition of justification and talk about the election, predestination, all these great theological themes, but we tend to abstract them from Jesus himself. And 
forget the fact that our whole relationship is really a relationship with Christ. And so our understanding of justification, sanctification, and eschatology, the end things, is really a reflection of our relationship to Jesus. I say that because in, in, in many circles today, it seems that there is, again, this separation between Christ himself, the person of Christ, and the last things, or our, our programs, our schemes with regard to eschatology. In one camp, you have those who are working out their timetables and the schemes, they're looking at various events in world history and reading their newspapers and saying, see, this is fulfilled in, in the prophecy of Scripture. Scripture foretold this or that or the other thing. And the last times are right here. And so they're, they're charting out all these different events. But it's like they're escaping the real big thing. Christ is coming. And trying to map out specific times and dates, I think, is uh, rather futile. Uh, Christ himself says, no man knows the day or the hour when he will come. We abstract the benefits from the person of Christ. And that is a problem. John was not guilty of that. He focuses our attention on Jesus Christ. It reminds us that we are the children of God, chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, see how great a love God, that God is for us and that we are called the children of God, and such is what we are. See how great a love God has for us. God has made us his very children. You cannot read those words of John, the author of the gospel, without being reminded of those great words of John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I, I was reading that just recently, this, I think it was just this week, um, and, and I was looking at it in the Greek text, and sometimes you see things while reading through the text that come to your mind that you might not often see on the surface in the English translation, but the word therefore, so, God so loved the world. I think it's not so much a, an expression of um, quantity. Um, he just loves you so, so, so much. He's so filled with passion for you. You, know, you look at sometimes some evangelical preachers, God is um, just this emotional blob. He's so in love with you. And he's just waiting for you to come to him. Well, there is an infinite expression of God's love in the sending of the Son. But I wonder if we, we shouldn't also reflect on, on the thought that maybe what John is saying is that for God, in this manner, loved the world in that He gave His own begotten Son. In this way, He showed His love in a peculiar way, in a unique way. Not really... God's love being expressed towards all of creation and bringing the sun, the moon, the stars, and uh, ripe fields uh, ready for the harvest and all these kinds of good blessings. He's given us many kinds of expressions of his love. But God, in this way in particular, uniquely so, showed his love by sending his own very son. That whoever believes in him should not perish. There is something unique to be found in this expression of love in the coming of Jesus Christ. Of course, the purpose of that was that we would become the children of God, that we would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be made new. And so uh, John often talks on this theme of adoption, our sonship. And this is part of the fact, that the reason why we can have a hope of the future because there is an inheritance. We are heirs of God and heirs of Christ Jesus. And so this whole idea of sonship, the fact that we are children of God, is inextricably linked to our future inheritance and our family life yet to come. And so John brings up this idea of the fact that we are the children of God, again, infusing it with this eschatological aspect. Behold what manner of love the Father has for us, that we should be called the children of God, such as what we are. And has 
not yet appeared, but we shall be. You see, we are now the children of God. We are now adopted into his family. We now have a spirit within us crying out, Father, Father. But this is only a glimpse. This is only a portion of what true sonship will mean for us when we enter into glory. When we will see what we shall be. We are now children of God, but there's much more yet to come. And that should fill us with hope. I say John's writings are infused with eschatology. Uh, you look at the previous chapter, uh, first in the 18th verse, uh, John, in, in setting a table, if you will, for this text that we're considering, he, he says that, uh, brothers, it is the last hour. You know, often in Scripture you come across the idea that these are the last days. And in Scripture, those last days are not just the, the last uh, few days or years prior to the return of Christ, and we're waiting for those last days, but rather the last days in Scripture apply to this whole period of time which we are now in, from the resurrection of Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit till the time of Christ's return. These are the last days. But John uh, adds an intensity to it by saying this is the last hour. Not just last days, but this is the last hour. There's a certain intensity to the coming of Christ. It's near at hand. Eschatology <coughs> is infused throughout John's worldview. And so he sees the coming of Antichrist and even the presence of Antichrist in the world today. This is an eschatological message. When you get to the 28th verse in the second chapter again, um, John talks about the the appearance of the Lord and His coming. These are two different words in the Greek which speak of the manifestation of Christ at the end of glory when He reveals Himself in His majesty and all His wonder. Remember, Brother Bob was talking about 1 Thessalonians 4 and how we shall see Him uh, at that last day and be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. It is a day of Christ's glory. It's his appearing, his manifestation. And then it is also his coming. There is uh, an approach of Christ towards world history, the end of time. John sees all things as infused with eschatology. He perhaps gets capped off with the third chapter of the third verse, where he speaks of this hope that we have of this coming. And he who has this hope within him purifies himself even as he is pure. And so John views all things in eschatological terms. In history and time, there is this great hope for the church, the coming of Christ. Now I say that because in our modern age, in our modern skeptical age, which seeks to interpret all things naturalistically, or at least to try to explain away the mythological, eschatological elements of Scripture, there's a, an effort to deny the coming of Christ. Jesus coming in, in, in bodily form, or bringing an end to history, judging all mankind. Indeed, going further than that, uh, bringing the wrath of God upon the wicked and ushering them into an eternity, facing the wrath of God. And then ushering a new heavens and a new earth for the people of God where they will live with renewed bodies forever and ever and ever. This, to the modern scientific mind, is impossible. To try to explain world history in secular humanistic terms. Gradual advance of culture. Uh, the, the advance of medicine and science and technology will improve the human race. Eventually we will become... Uh, we will live longer and longer. And so there's an effort in theological circles as well to deny the real history and the end of history in terms of the coming of Christ. That is detrimental to the Christian faith. If we take away the return of Christ and try to talk about the ethics of Jesus and the way of life of Christ and say, well, we can understand these ethics 
separated from the return of Christ, separated from this notion of judgments and, and rewards and punishments and all these things that get to come, we can understand the ethics of Jesus on their own merit and live accordingly. I say to you that you, you cannot properly understand the ethics of Jesus, nor will you really provide for a moral life as a result. First, to, to look at Jesus and his teachings about how we should live. Think of the Sermon on the Mount and how that sermon similarly is infused with eschatology. Jesus writes about the, the, the dangers of hatred and hostility and anger. What is the real problem there? Well, part of it is if, if you hate your brother and, and uh, are, are liable before the court because of it, there is a penalty to pay for that. And the intimation is that, that it is a long-lasting penalty when he considers the, the danger of lust and the dangers of adultery. Jesus warns that it is better for you to pluck out your eye or chop off your hand than to engage in these sexual acts and be cast into hell. Matthew chapter uh, 24 where Jesus talks about the end of history. He sees this great uh, gathering of all the nations before him, and the sheep are separated from the goats. What is it that is a motivation for our good works, for serving Christ? Well, the sheep go into everlasting life. The goats go into hell. Ethics and eschatology go hand in hand. And a, a proper biblical Christian view of ethics is that we, as the children of God, ought to please our Redeemer. Indeed, the motivation is not, well, we're going to be judged, so we've got to make sure we follow the, the, the details of the law and make sure we get by. No, there is a more personal perspective here in John's writings. We are the children of God, and we know Jesus. We know He is righteous. We know He is pure. And that is what sanctifies us. Because we want to be ready for Him when He comes. As Paul, uh, excuse me, John, at the end of the chapter says, we don't want to shrink back from Him in shame when He appears, but we want to approach Him boldly, with confidence, because we've been walking with Him. After this section, John chapter, 1 John 3, He's going to talk about those who practice wickedness and those who practice righteousness. All of that is grounded on Christ and His coming and our desire to be pleasing to Him. How do you want to improve your life? How do you want to overcome evil? How do you want to purify your life? Well, it's not merely by reflecting upon law and requirement and statute true that all that is, and important as all that is, but that's insufficient. There needs to be a, a, a willingness to see all that in view of Jesus himself and his person. He is coming. I want to be ready for him. And that desire for Jesus, that desire to meet with him and to be ready for him to enter into his fellowship, is that which most of all, purifies our hearts, purifies our minds, purifies our lives. Because we want to be pure, and righteous, and holy for Jesus Christ. We shall be like Him. That's the goal for which we are redeemed, to be like Jesus. And so therefore, that expectation that we will be with Him should be a motivation to us to purify our to make our lives more holy. Now let me circle back for just a moment and uh, remind you what John says, that there are many antichrists in the world and that there are those that are attempting to deceive you. There are those who would mislead you, saying, well, th there is no coming of Christ. Remember what 
Uh, Peter says in the second epistle of the third chapter that there are many scoffers who come to the world and say, the world just continues on just as it has always been. Where is this promise of this coming? And so uh, scoffers, those who are unbelieving, will try to persuade you that there is no coming of Christ. Look, the world's been going on for nearly 2,000 years. Where is he? And so they mock and they laugh and so forth. And so there are all kinds of efforts to undermine your faith in Christ and his coming. Antichrist is in the world. There are many who try to undermine the teaching of Christ's return. But John says that you have an anointing from the Lord. You have the Holy Spirit, and you all know. The children of God know that Jesus is coming. They know who Jesus is. They don't need to be taught about Jesus as the Christ. We understand that. And so therefore, we with confidence look forward to his return again. But we need to be alert to the fact that there are others who are trying to mislead us. Now, when John says that you don't need anyone to teach you, He's not saying, don't sit in your church, don't listen to your pastor, don't listen to your teachers, pay no attention to them. You can just take your Bible, learn it on your own, and, and, and be fine. That's not his point. His point is you don't need to be listening to these false teachers as though they have something to add to you, as though they have a better understanding of the world. They don't. You need to see Jesus. God has given you his spirit to teach you about Jesus, about who he is, and how he wants you to live. We need to reorient our life, reorient our understanding of Christian ethics to the person of Jesus and the desire to please him. As he reveals in his ways and his word and his law, the gospel, all throughout the scriptures, but it's always focused on Christ. The danger is that we become Pharisaical and simply do the right thing and leave it at that without seeking to serve Christ in doing the right thing. He who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. May God grant us grace to look to the coming of Christ, and see him coming to transform us and to make us the children of God. And then glory, wonder, beauty, perfection be ours in Christ. What a beautiful thing. What a great hope. May that be a motivating factor in our Christian lives. Father, well, we pray that as we reflect on the coming of Christ and see that he is indeed coming, we pray that it would transform our hearts and minds and help us evermore to have fellowship with you, to abide in you, to have your word abiding in us, to have your spirit guiding us, that we might be ready for when you come. Grant that we would break off sinful habits. Grant that we would pursue those things which are uh, righteous and godly, holy, we pray that you would receive us in Christ, that on that last day, each one of us here will approach him with great boldness and confidence, because we shall be like him. We pray in Jesus' name.